You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with a Good Question podcast. I have uh, Fiacra O'Sullivan. He goes by Figs. He's a relationship expert. The website is empathy.com, E-M-P-A-T-H-I.com. And we're going to talk about how to make marriage work and meet your partner in the middle. So Figs, thanks so much for coming. How are you doing? I'm brilliant. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Yeah, I guess Fiacra is uh, an Irish name, right? Is it yeah, yeah. way? exactly. Fiacra. But I like, yeah. you know... I'm, yeah, it's weird where the emphasis is on, right? But um, yeah, it's an old, old Irish name. Well, Connor said tattoo figs. That's about all I know. So. <laughs> there you go. Very good. Yeah. Well, tell me a bit about your background. How did you get into, I don't know if we want to call marriage counseling or to, you know, how did you start thinking about the dynamics of marriage? Yeah, well, so, you know, the the real answer is, look, I, I'm the son of a alcoholic father and heartbroken mother and being part of a family, feeling a sense of belonging was always the most important thing to me. If, you know, even if I wasn't aware of it as a kid, I worked really hard to make love and relationship work as an adult, as a grown up, got my ass handed to me many times. Yeah. And everyone in the family is a therapist. One of the, the true gifts, you know, if, it's, if I can call it that, that alcoholism gave our family is we all, you know, went on a healing path and became healers ourselves, right? Dad's a therapist, mother is a social worker, my sister's a therapist. And I just, as soon as I sat with my first couple as a therapist, I just loved it. It was so alive, so dynamic. And, you know, and the stakes were so high, you know, I just was hooked. I, I was just totally addicted to it. That's cool. So your parents, even though they had a lot of issues. They were still therapists during this time? No, they became therapists after the Oh, interesting. Right? That, that huh. was like, you know, pain and suffering. You know, I always say people change out of, for one of two reasons, inspiration or desperation. And you can count on one hand the number of people in human history that have changed out of inspiration. Huh. Yeah, it makes sense, unfortunately. Yeah. Unless something really bad happens, it doesn't spur people to change or take action. So I understand. Yeah. Um, okay, so you you counseled this first couple you loved it i guess it sounds like you knew which this is what you wanted to do for a long time or perhaps forever yeah um, but i went then, in a different direction first i should say look was very lucky that i got to go to private high school in ireland and i got to i managed somehow to get the grades good enough to go to trinity college dublin and study business and economics I became a stock bro. I came to America and I worked for Merrill Lynch as a, you know, stock broker. And then I became a stock option specialist, employee stock option specialist. From like, you know, was the first person to bring like investment bankers into Google for Citigroup when I worked for them. And I was the black sheep of the family. I tried to go a different direction. But here's the way I think about that early part of my career. I mean, I learned a lot. It was incredible. I learned a lot about human nature, <laughs> including my own, right? But um, but but it really, I, I think of that was primarily a fear based, not an inspiration based, like initial path I was on. Did you feel that becoming by that by becoming a therapist, that's how you were able to handle your past and no other way? I mean, I wouldn't quite say that. I think becoming a, well, so what basically I think becoming a stockbroker, then eventually called a financial consultant, was me trying, look, if I make money, then I won't have to deal with my childhood wounding and my pain. But, but then interestingly, when I gave it up, I then went, I didn't give it up and instantly become a therapist. I gave it up and luckily I, you know, had the time and the resources to go work on myself. And I actually just primarily entered this war as someone on a, their own personal journey of self-exploration. So I used to live at this place called Esalen. I know some of your listeners might be familiar with it. It's 
you know, it was kind of known as the Harvard of the human potential movement. So I was very lucky. I got to live there, be a student there, be immersed. Oh, in. What, what kind of things did you do there? Well, firstly, I had to be a community member. I had to serve a purpose. So I worked in the kitchen, right, as part of the community. I had to cook meals. Uh, but then, you know, I, I did lots of psychotherapy, a lot of work on improvisation, theater improvisation, dance improvisation, just ways in order to really be able to hear and know what it is I'm actually feeling in a given moment of time and how to respond organically, like from actually deep inside myself and how to truly like, you know, be impacted and affected by the world outside of me. If you don't mind, I want to go back to when you said your parents became therapists and your sister, did you... Yeah. Did they become therapists before you did? And when they did, were you like, what the hell? You guys did this, that, the other, now you're therapists? Did you think that in your mind or what, what went on with that? Not at all. I think no. I would have, that's why. No, I mean, look, it was just always a part of my life growing up, like self-development, like I'm being curious, trying to be conscious, trying to get to know, like, you know, the, the main question in consciousness is what is it like to be me? So, you know, way before anyone was a therapist, obviously my dad, my mom, my sister and I, we were curious about what is it like to be me? What is it like to be another human being? What is it like? What's actually happening in the dynamics? So the actual becoming a therapist was just a natural outcome of an organic process that we we're all really interested and curious about. Hmm. It'd be kind of funny if you all sat around and you're like, dad, tell me how this feels. And he goes, no, you tell me how this feels. And you, you kind of like, therapized each other but made it a game but not i don't know it just i just thought it might be funny but probably not well i mean look i it is a part of why i like doing these podcasts is that like obviously there's a little often there's a little bit of a gap in understanding what it is to be a therapist right um like i'm sure sometimes people meet an MMA fighter, and they're probably scared in case they're going to like suddenly wrestle them to the ground right put them in an arm bar but but yeah look I, there's not yeah, they, it, it, I, I get the humor in it. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, have been able to be curious about yourself and share what you're feeling and be curious about someone else makes for very rich conversations. Mm. By the way, if I, if I can add one of the things I actually find talking to people in like everyday conversations is much harder because everybody's committed to just being the representative and not letting you know who they really are. Speaking as a therapist to a client, the client actually gets to be all of themselves. I get to meet some all of a person and I don't have to just do a uh, cocktail party. Yeah, but wouldn't there be pressure even when you were the therapist to maybe like, let's say maybe someone thinks they're really messed up and they're going to a therapist and yes, they want help, but maybe they still do hold back because they're like, wow, if this person thought I was this bad, they might say, I can't help you. I mean, is there a fear? Of course, some people are like that. They they fear that. But look, a big part of the job, you know, you're asking wonderful questions in a sense, because usually the biggest problem is that the person thinks they're really messed up and there's something wrong with them. And of course, that you know, 999 times out of a thousand, that's not true. The biggest problem is the way they think there's something wrong with them. And so the first job, let's say, is to what would be called counter shame that person and help them realize you're really normal and you're friggin' awesome. And this negative story you have about yourself is actually what's holding you back. And it's okay to be all of you. And you don't have to be hiding, abandoning, or rejecting parts of yourself. That okay. That's what's crazy. The, the way the world is, is crazy. Right in here, when you're talking to me, we don't have to be insane. Like, it's okay that you have fears about yourself. You're not sure if you feel the way you want to feel. Psh, that's totally normal. Yeah, okay. Well, so you started doing therapy. How did you decide to make it your own? Or what is your own special brand of therapy like what have you done with empathy and you know, how are yeah. you doing things differently yeah well you know so you know like i said i primarily focus on relationships and helping people have better relationships couples counseling marriage counseling counseling individuals 
And, you know, I kind of spoke to it a little bit is a lot of counter shaming people, helping people be themselves and accept their partner as themselves. And then through that process, helping them feel more connected to each other than they ever could have been if they didn't go through such a transformational process. It, and I know you obviously you can't reveal private conversations, but can you somehow give an example of when you could feel that someone had shifted and become more open to you or a couple, like you just said, you saw that all of a sudden they, they became closer and a barrier came down. Yeah. Well, obviously it happens all the time, right? So let me just, I'll just a little bit. The first thing we need to work on with a couple is you help them go from two separate stories of what's going on, right? They each have their individual story of what's going on. And there's actually a third entity in their relationship. It's the system that they're co-creating with each other. And once I help both of them see the systemic story where both of them make sense and both how they're feeling and then the way they're reacting makes sense, that actually helps their limbic systems. It's not just woo-woo. It's literally biology. It helps their limbic systems and their nervous systems feel safer with each other. And you can, you know, when, when people make that transition to really get what's happening between both of us and neither of us are the bad guy, you can feel it in the room. Like they can look at each other, they can laugh, they sit closer to each other, they might be holding each other's hands, their knees are touching. And, you know, that, that, so that's actually the big transfer. That's the first big transformational experience in couples counseling, what we call de-escalation. We're not even trying to make things better necessarily yet, like in terms of solving any particular problems. First thing we got to do is help their their limbic systems know that they're not under a threat. And it's, yeah, it, it's it's visible. Yeah, you know, it's easily identifiable that um, ah, these people have actually de-escalated and they actually are a team again, not a threat to each other. Mm. Yeah, I've been, you know, with my wife for about, uh, yeah, coming up on 24 years. And as you're talking, I'm thinking, so, you know, when things are good, I don't have to worry. I just, I'm, whether I exist, I say things, I don't need to, you know, hold anything back. And when there's a, an argument and stuff like that, then it seems like both people go back into themselves and this thing called relationship separates for a bit. And now you have like two individuals that are looking at each other over a, over a fence or, you know, they're, they're looking at each other instead of like sitting with each other. You know what I mean? That's, uh, exactly. Exactly. That, that makes sense. That totally makes sense. And that's, you know, so and my work, let's say in a situation like that is just to help both of you feel how hard it is for both of you to be disconnected in those moments to have empathy for how hard it is for the other person and to see, ah, oh, would you look how awful this is that we have gotten stuck like this? And there's how could we give each other explicitly a chance to get back connected to each other? Because we mean so much. As opposed to letting it just happen like, hey, I'm tired fighting. You want to go for Chinese? Yeah, why not? Like we actually <laughs> make it an explicit process because we love each other and because the magic of a relationship is not actually in being connected all the time. The magic of a relationship happens when we are willing and brave enough to do real repairs with each other. This may sound kind of silly, but I think millions of times around the world, the same conversation happens in early evening. You know, what, what do you want to eat? I don't know. What do you want to eat? I chose last time. Well, I don't want to go here. What about you know, so and maybe it's a silly example, but is that a good example of how, um, yeah. you know, with a change in language that a couple could work better together? Well, yeah. So this is where, look, at the very least, it would be great if people were open to understanding the science of what love is. And again, it's science. In short, the best theory we have of what love is, is love is the need to be attached, emotionally bonded. And we all need to be emotionally bonded from the cradle to the grave. It's not optional. When you were born, if you didn't have a good enough other be there on the other side of your birth, a dingo would come and eat you. So if it looks like your primary person isn't there, your body is built to feel really bad inside and to protest it so that you stay alive, right? <laughs> it's just like, again, it's not like, you know, you know, touched by an angel love. It's from the ground up, the essence of what it is to be a human being. So... Here you are a grown up and you may not be aware that actually when my primary person isn't there for me, 
I actually get threatened inside. You actually think, look, I just don't know what I want to eat. What the hell? I chose yesterday, right? But actually, what's happening is both of your answers, like, hey, what do you want to eat? Oh, Jesus, I might be in trouble if I don't answer right. And then I say, I chose yesterday. And the other person is, oh, my God. How come you won't show up? I asked you a simple question. You won't answer me. Both of you are actually experiencing, even if you're not aware of it, an emotional bonding related threat in that conversation. Because you both look like you're not there for each other in the way you long for. And because you're each other's primary person, it actually hits threatening places inside. What does a couple do when there's... um... I guess, an outside threat, and they feel differently about it, and they want to respond differently about it, but it would be better if they unite. Is there a process through which they can go to acknowledge it and then come to a common understanding? Absolutely. So the most, well, again, so here's like, of course, it's messy. Nothing is perfectly smooth, but but let's, I mean, there's a couple of different types of outside threats, but, you know, give me an example of what you mean by an outside threat. So I answer accurately um i don't know let's say a neighbor is being a real jerk and uh right. either making noise or throwing something into the yard yeah. or who knows you know, what, like that. what's your neighbor's name i don't know it's not a real example but i'm, I'm, just kidding. Say Bob. I'm kidding you're Bob's kidding you. yeah, 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 yeah okay so let's say there's a neighbor throwing stuff in the yard and one person is a let's throw stuff back or like you know slashes tires and the other person is hey i think we should go talk to him right so look the most important first thing to do is to be able to see, like, what is the emotional bonding issue that's happening between you and me, dear spouse of mine? How is it that we're not feeling we're there for each other? And is there a way we can prioritize each other's feelings that are coming up that was triggered by the neighbor throwing stuff into our yard? And if the two of us can actually show that we accept each other's feelings, our feelings are valid, and forgive my technical language, we give a shit about each other's feelings. Now, because we're back emotionally bonded, you're going to be at the most resource place inside of yourselves, both of you, and between each other to come up with the right plan of action to deal with the neighbor. Now, as an outside party, I vote the slashing the tires, but it's not up to me. It's going to be up to that couple. How do you, I don't know if you see this, but in certain relationships, do you see that, I don't know, one or both people, everything's about them somehow, even when the issue is not about them, they make it about them. I was going to ask you, like, what are what are some of the, either the most common or the most intractable right. problems that you see? So that just came to mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So look, the whole, it, they always make it about them. So because it's not, the issue isn't what they're talking about, right? Deep down inside, on some level, they don't really feel a, they're getting a particular flavor of love, whether that's I really don't feel seen, I really don't feel heard, I really don't feel considered, I really don't feel valued. And so, yeah, no matter what, whatever topic it is, you're like, can you believe the Eagles lost? That was They were robbed right? Look, and they're going to go, they're going to say, like, you know what, I don't like the Super Bowl. I think it's like, well, why are they saying that in that moment? Because on some level, deep down inside, they're still fighting for a particular flavor of love from you. And until that flavor of love is acknowledged, accepted, it's validated, and they actually receive that love. Yeah, they're going to make it quote unquote about themselves. Interesting. What about um, if you have one person and a couple that never can admit they're wrong? Yeah, but again, so look, if someone can't admit they're wrong, right? Like, so what would it be like for them to admit they're wrong? Usually when someone can't admit they're wrong is because they feel shame inside. So there's four things people do when they feel ashamed. They attack other, attack self, deny there's a problem or collapse. So if someone cannot admit they're wrong, it's just because the pain of the not enoughness or too muchness is so unbearable for them that they, this is the crazy thing that we do as human beings. I would rather executing this strategy, I'll never admit I'm wrong, even though it'll hurt the other person. The other person will now look at me like I'm even more wrong, but it's still almost impossible for me to feel deeply my own shame. So I'll continue to engage in a strategy that inevitably is going to make things worse for me. But here's the punchline. 
how awful for that person. I have nothing but love and care for that person. And through loving for loving them and understanding them, they'll one day feel safe enough to actually give up that strategy and feel the shame and have an opportunity to be loved and cared for in that place where they feel bad about themselves. I've got one more to ask you. I've heard this throughout the years from some people like, um, uh, I don't know, this waitress I knew, she lived with her mom still, she was probably in her 40s and you know, her brother and sister didn't live with the mom and it just seemed like she gave her life to the mom, you know? So I said, why don't you do this or that or maybe do this and that? She just said, I know. And like a sad, resigned voice. And I've heard that from different people throughout time and I don't know why they say that or what that means. Like, what are they saying when they say something? Well, so what what does it mean when they say that? Yeah, I ask because I've heard it a lot from different people. Yeah, yeah. And it's always when there's something that to some, maybe to someone else's eye, it, it's something that's hurting them, but they just can't or won't or whatever overcome right. it. And they, they give us yeah, resigned like... Mm-hmm. Yeah, but this is where I think, no offense, you might be misinterpreting what the invitation is for you when they tell you this information. What people usually want is to truly be listened to, to feel heard, and to see you accept their experience and you validate them and you feel empathy for them because that actually gives an opportunity for real connection. When you're offering a solution... Here's the weird thing, even though you're coming from the best good hearted place in the world to offer a solution, you've actually missed the most important thing that needed to happen, that they felt you were really with them in a living moment of time and you got them. But when you jump to offering a solution, it actually is kind of sad and depressing because you missed them. Okay, I guess this comes from my guidance. You know, I have to no, I solve get things it. when I hear problems instead of like to yeah. me, just listening is like hard. Exactly. To well, well, that would be your work as opposed to right. Your work, ideally, if you wanted to go to gym and how to have a better relationship would be, how can I be present more with people, accept, validate their experience and have empathy for them and th- to a point where they feel it and delay offering solutions. If if you empathize with someone and then they offer you, like they ask you, like I always say, like as a therapist, look, I'm like a vampire. I have to be invited in, right? Can't be walking <laughs> over people's threshold unless I've been invited in. You know, all guys out there, let's say your solution, like solution finding, you know, um, chronic value adding part of you um, with your hands, sit on your hands. Sit on your hands, listen to some people, empathize with them. Connection is what people need. They don't actually need solution. Yeah, that's an alien concept, but I'll, I'll try to take it to heart here. Well, if, if, you know. if you knew it, then sure, why, you know, then it wouldn't be important for you. Yeah, thanks for giving that example. I'm, I'm not trying to make this just about me, but I'm just oh, I'm giving I, things that I've seen. I noticed that, that you're not trying to make it about you. But that's the thing. It, this is just an important point, right? It's really easy to see other people. It's not that easy to study and be curious about ourselves and what we co-create with other human beings. That's the real work. Hmm, interesting. Okay. So in your couples therapy, what you know, I asked this a little while ago, but what, what are some of the most difficult problems that you see couples face? that are the hardest for them to break through and resolve? Well, like an affair, right? Betrayal is definitely you know, probably the hardest, right? Yeah, an affair is probably the hardest. But then also, weirdly, is two people that are both committed to withdrawing from conflict. They're both conflict avoiders. They're both, everything's okay. We don't have to deal with something. Though that kind of couple is actually very hard because I actually have to light a fire under their little seats and create some uh, enough discomfort that they'll they'll actually get to see what their real wounding is. Because what I need in order to help people is their suffering. And most people are pretty committed to not suffering, right? So, but I need to see their suffering if I'm going to be able to turn that base metal of suffering into gold, right? Through the alchemical process that is, you know, experiential psychotherapy. Hmm. Um, what about if you have a couple where there's been uh, domestic violence, you know, one hit the well, other, does that well, happen? Yeah, sorry. I mean, yeah, I should say that couples counseling is not indicated. It's not appropriate to do couples counseling if there's domestic violence or a risk of domestic violence. So uh-huh. just, uh, sorry, yeah. So there's kind of um, an assumption here, a prerequisite is that 
there's not domestic violence or risk of domestic violence. I'm not going to sit with a couple where starting to do that kind of exploration of self, hearing the other person and exploring and understanding and feeling what we co-create with each other that makes it so difficult. Like if that process is at risk of someone's going to be, or both people could be physically hurt, right? Um, then they need to do individual counseling first so that they can sort that out individually so that it's safe for us to come together, you know, in a couple to do relationship work. How do you, um, I don't know if you've had instances, but is it a problem sometimes where a couple will come and both will say a bunch of things and then they leave and then one of them like attacks the other verbally? I can't believe you said that, that kind of thing. You know, when they should leave it with... You know, otherwise they're going to be afraid to tell you something. So have you seen that? And what happens then? No, of course. No, no, of course it does. I mean, it happens all the time. Look, I always think it's funny, like fig said can be used. It's amazing. This is like, look, words, the exact same words will fig said can be used. And as um, it helps the couple, it's an invitation to deescalate. We both make sense. Right. But also, well, fig said can be used to shame, reject or abandon their partner. And look, it's, it's a normal part of the process that that, you know, we're trying to invite vulnerability and sharing and study of the system. It makes sense that sometimes in the session, one person says something that the it was really hard for the other partner <laughs> to hear and then also be seen hearing by a third party and that they'll be mad at them, right? But, you know, so again, we'll study it, organize it, try and understand what happened inside of both people, put it in the system and help them de-escalate, right? Like when people fight and they get upset with each other, it's brilliant, right? Because that's the real power of couples counseling is that we don't Hmm. just work on things academically, we actually work on it in real time. It's not, it's like kind of like, imagine like if you're training to be a firefighter, right? Wouldn't it be great if you actually trained at putting out real fires versus studying how to put out fires? So that's what, yeah, what I love about couples counseling is like, we actually work on it in real time while the fire just got ignited and it's getting bigger, uh, if that makes sense. Hmm. Would it? So you have the benefit of hearing hundreds and hundreds of things and resolving lots of conflicts. Yeah. Um, the clients themselves, I mean, would there be a way where, let's say you just had the audio with names, you know, bleeped out if there's any. But again, would it be helpful for couples going through counseling if they could hear a couple of other couples? You know, again, they wouldn't know who they are, yeah. but they could hear like some of the issues come up and part of a therapy session if permission was given. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. And by the way, my wife and I have our own podcast. It's called, a, I hope it's not a plug for the podcast, but if it would be helpful for people, it's, okay, yeah. that it's called the Come Here to Me podcast. And we actually share, we're, we're both couples therapists. We both train other therapists, we're trainers of couples therapists, right? We've both done, I don't know what I've done, like 20,000 hours. She's done like 15,000 hours as a couples therapist, like, you know, we're whatever level of mastery of this stuff. And we actually share our own personal couples therapy sessions where we're the clients and we talk about the session beforehand we share the therapy session and we talk about it afterwards and we oh, wow. share that with the with the world with the pub with the general public again to try and help them understand how normal they are uh, what relationships are really like and how you can you know transform hard moments into even deeper connection that would be possible if that hard moment never happened at all that's really cool. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, no, I want to provide uh, resources for listeners. So um, if you can, just restate the name of your podcast and where is it. And yeah, I definitely encourage people interested to check it out. Yeah. But go ahead. So, yeah, it's just a Come Here to Me podcast. Come Here to Me podcast. Okay. It's uh, it's on all the, like, whatever. It's on all the streaming, right. like, platforms, right? Yeah, it's wherever a podcast can be heard. Exactly. There you go. You know, you know the lingo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. So what's, um, in your, from your point of view, like why do couples, I don't know if it's like they give up after a long time and they do couples therapy. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but what, why do they engage in couples therapy? What triggers them to say, okay, let's try it? Well, so the main thing that triggers them to try it is that everything they've been doing hasn't working, right? Whether that's minimizing the problems, confronting the problems, like, defending themselves criticizing whatever stuff they do 
it hasn't been working and it hurts so much that they're finally willing to actually try to get some expert advice. Now, the problem is, you know, most, not all couples counseling is the same. Like what I just described to you isn't what most couples therapists do, right? They're not actually working and trying to find, uh, look, you both make sense. I get how you're both hurting and I can understand your reactivity and then help them feel safe and then help them reach out and get their needs met vulnerably from each other. Like most couples therapists are still just like being, what would you call it? Like judge and jury. And they're like helping people correct their behaviors, offering solutions. And like I said, that that shit doesn't work. So here's the really sad thing is most, you know, they go couples counsel and they reach out for it, but it doesn't mean they're actually getting effective help. No, and it goes, I feel like I've earned the right to say that after, you know, this is like, I have to get, I have to be good at something. I just happen yeah. to find this <laughs> this thing, right? Like, luckily, I wasn't a great potato farmer. I wasn't a great stockbroker. I was too scared playing rugby, even though, I, you know, I loved it. But I really didn't like when someone ran directly at me as hard as they could. And I was supposed to tackle oh, yeah. them. So, yeah. but luckily, the old couples counseling thing happened to be like, oh, who knew? So, hmm. so, hey, so look, yeah, like, here's what I would recommend. Obviously, reach out to us at empathy, you know, like you said, empathy with an I at the end dot com, right? We couldn't afford empathy with a Y in the end dot com. So we had to just Jimmy rig like empathy dot com, right? Um, oh, okay. You, I think, I, reach I, think out I, to us. I accidentally pronounced it wrong. I think I put him in empathy. <laughs> I know, but look, you were consistent, right? You would le- you pronounce the company name the same way you pronounce my name. So I really like the consistency. Thank you. Yeah. You know, this this uh this made me go laugh. I did an escape room with my kids a couple of years ago. We were down to the wire, and there was like this puzzle. We had to arrange the letters, and I was frustrated, and I I didn't know what it was saying. I, I thought it said incandidi or something. I just said it out loud, and it was actually I can decide. My kids made fun of me for like years after that. Right, right, right. So this is like another example. <laughs> nice. I know. I but I had something like that with my kids the other day too. Is what how did I read Chihuahua? And I was like, I can't really even remember how I pronounce it, but my daughter loves that my reading skills are so limited, you know, that I couldn't pronounce Chihuahua. <laughs> but yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. Well, very cool. Just just a couple of questions more and then we'll wrap. Um so having done so many thousands of hours of therapy, what are some of the common trends that you see and are they changing over time? You, know, you must be doing this for X number of years. So what do you see that you didn't see before only because you have so much experience? Oh, people are reaching out earlier. The good news is like younger generations, you know, their threshold for what is acceptable levels of disconnection or discord and relationship is lower and lower, and they will reach out for help. So that's really encouraging. They're less likely to go, sure, isn't this life? Don't you just put up with what you get? You knew you knew what you're getting into when you married me. They're, you know, I, you, I, I have to do that in an Irish accent for some reason, right? They're like a real what? Irish. But yeah. like they're less willing to tolerate that shit. And so they're going to reach out for therapy sooner. The other thing, just to be clear, is what I see is that people are really good. People are really doing their best. Right. They just not they don't fully understand themselves and they don't feel fully understood. And everything changes once they feel really accepted, validated and empathized with by their partner. Everything can get better if it can get make them have that experience with each other. Um, And then the last thing is like it's less likely. Look, again, let's say, you know, if I'm 51, right, my generation, it's definitely more likely that the person that is emotionally withdrawn in relationship is a guy in a heterosexual relationship. And the woman, let's say, in a heterosexual relationship is the one that is feeling not prioritized and is always looking for more connection. That is shifting with new the younger generations, that it's it's more of a toss up. <laughs> Right. Who's going to be the one that is like, hey, hey, give me some time to be on Instagram. Like that's as likely to be the woman as the man. And the man is as likely as the woman to be like, how come you're not spending more time with? Very interesting. All right. Oh, I was going to say, oh, are there any other I don't know, big dividing lines? Like um, you see couples where one's an introvert, one's an extrovert. You know, does that cause friction or? You know, what, what are some um, elements in couples where they've yeah. already chosen each other, but 
you can see like there's something fundamental that's going to make it hard for them to have a good relationship. Yeah. Well, so look, well, so here's the thing, right? All of that stuff. I'm an introvert. You're an extrovert. You love Trump. I love Biden. I'm an anti-vaxxer. You're like vaccinating yourself daily. Like just getting, <laughs> extra, getting extras for fun. Right. Look, here's the weird thing. It's going to sound weird to people. That stuff isn't actually as important as you think. If we sort out the attachment, the from the ground up biology, that you're so important to me, I need to know that I'm a priority to you. And you're, and then the other way around, you're so important to me that I need to know I'm enough for you. You're not disappointed in me. If we sort that part out, it's amazing how much all the other shit doesn't matter that much. Like, like as long as I, if, if I'm a priority to my wife and I'm enough for her and she's a priority to me and she's enough for me, I don't mind. She can head off to a Trump rally today. Hey, good luck, sweetie. I'll help you make your sign. I don't care, right? As if we have the, like, you know, as long as she doesn't try and vaccinate me, give me extra shots. I'm being <laughs> facetious now, right? But like, it's sort of, here's the crazy thing. Most stuff does it. What really matters is the love stuff. And we then make the other stuff a big deal if we're not really feeling that emotional bond with each other. So sort the emotional bonding part out first. And then return to your, I'm an introvert, I'm an extrovert, or I love wearing red hats with, you know, make America great again. And you you love your blue hats. Like, I, I will be very surprised if that stuff is actually that important if we sort out the emotional bonding piece. But is, is that kind of stuff dividing people today more? And if so, why? Or is it just... Yeah. Yes. And it's really... Well, again, it is dividing people more, for sure. And again, you know, it's, it's if we can get the issue is just whatever the issue is, let's say it was we both believe in different. We have different political beliefs. I'll just use that as an example. But it, I have to make sure on time. Yeah, I'm good. So we both believe in different political like, you know, we we're on different ends of the political spectrum. Um, that's actually not the biggest issue. The biggest issue would be when we talk about politics, one of us, let's say, for example, feels unheard. And the other feels, right, that I'm unacceptable. If we can get the couple to actually empathize and care about the feelings of being unheard and the feelings of being unacceptable, right, that's the thing. If we can accomplish that and then we return to a political conversation, I guarantee you that political conversation is going to be very, very different. It'll be it could actually be very productive. So so look, I mean, why is there more division in our society is, of course, we're not having those conversations. We're not accepting and validating each other. It's easier to live in our individual, you know, our separate like uh, echo chambers and bubbles. And it's just so much more acceptable. Again, I don't have to accept and validate and empathize with people. Right. I can go to my little Facebook group or I can go to my family or my church or my yoga community, wherever, whatever world you live in. And I'm just going to be in an echo chamber, get confirmation bias. So, look, the world is set up today that we're losing the art of accepting other people's experience as valid and empathizing with them and making it safe for each other to get along with each other. People are good. That's the thing. I really want to like, what's my big takeaway from doing all this work and meeting people at their worst, you know, would say people are really good. Well, well Figs, it's been, um, it's been a great call. I had a lot of fun, I learned a lot of stuff and it was really cool to meet you. And um, let, let's recap now, where can listeners go for your podcast, for your website, for counseling, yeah. et cetera. What are all these resources? Yeah. So the, the podcast is come here to me podcast. Right. And there's a website, come here to me podcast.com. And then our main website where we have an app that we built for couples, it's all free, is empathy with a 90 end.com. And then we obviously we offer counseling and coaching for individuals and couples all over America and the world and, you know, English speaking world and Spanish. But um, that's yeah, empathy with a 90 end.com. And I think that's, and then all of the social media stuff is empathy now. So it's empathy with an I and N O W. On all the platforms. Okay, and then do you do you do, uh, you do in person and online? Or we do all online. Apps? All of the actual counseling or coaching. Oh, huh. well, very good. Well, again, thanks. It's been a great call. I really appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Bye. 
Thank you for listening to the Good Question Podcast. Please email support at thegoodquestionpodcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview. Visit thegoodquestionpodcast.com to hear more interviews. And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast. 